Hi, everyone. I wanted to just make a few short videos and wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Hope you're able to spend some time with your family. Um, the first one is actually a correction of the previous um, vaccine video that I did last week. And the correction uh, is due to some more information I received. And I particularly want to give a shout out to David Martin, who did a wonderful video on the, both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we'll try to provide a link to it, but I'm sure if you go to David Martin's website, you can find the video he gave. Uh, it turns out it's actually worse than I thought. And as I said in my, the previous video, which is the reason why we took it down, it wasn't censored as far as we know, but I took it down because there was something inaccurate and David Martin's video corrected me on that. And so I just wanted to make sure I got this accurate. And it turns out to be a lot worse than I thought. So the, my first goal here is to make sure that everybody who listens to me is absolutely clear on what we mean, we being the medical profession and the scientific community, by this concept called risk reduction or relative risk. Because seriously, if you don't know a uh, hundred percent what this means, you will not be able to understand scientific or medical research. You literally have to know this uh, forwards and backwards. So let's go over that first. So imagine we have a trial and it's a properly done trial with an appropriate placebo. And the goal is something like uh, the prevention of heart attacks. So we have a medicine, a drug, and we wanna test whether it prevents heart attacks. And so, and again, for each step, I just assume that the control is properly, properly done. Everything about the trial is properly done as far as possible. So then you have a trial and you have 10 people and you give them this drug to prevent heart attacks and an appropriately controlled 10 people you don't give them the drug to prevent heart attacks. And then you create an appropriately timed end time, like two years, you see what happens. At the end of the two years, what you find is two of the people you did not give the drug to, that's two out of 10, had a heart attack. And one of the people who you did give the drug to, that's one out of 10, had a heart attack. Now, you write this up and you report it in the medical literature, and what do you say? So it's obvious to anybody that 10% of the people who took the drug had a heart attack, and 20% of the people who didn't take the drug had a heart attack. So one would think that you would report there was a 10% reduction in heart attacks. That's called the absolute risk. Now, believe it or not, and I know this will be hard for people to believe, but I would say the overwhelming majority, including all the vaccine trials and all the statin trials and all the antidepressant drug trials, and literally almost all medical drug trials, are not reported as absolute reduction. What they're reported in as the benefit in that case is 33%. Now you could ask, how did they get 33%? Because it's actually not a lie. The answer is one, that's the number of people in the drug part, plus two, that's the number of people in the controls, got a heart attack, so three people total got heart attacks. Two of them were in the placebo, one in the drug trial, so 66% minus 33% is 33%. So that is the relative risk, that is the risk reduction, 33%, and that is how the number is reported. Now imagine you did the same trial, but you did it with 100 people in each. So the difference would be 1% of the drugs and 2% of the controls. And that would be a reduction of 1%.
except it would still be reported as a 33% reduction because one plus two is three and two is 66% of three and one is 33%. Therefore, that is a redu risk reduction of 33%. Now, here my math is gonna be a little challenged, but imagine you did it with a million people in each arm. So one out of a million people who took the drug had a heart attack and two out of the million people who didn't take the drug had a heart attack. What is the absolute risk uh, reduction in heart attacks? It's 0 0.00 some, I don't know exactly how many zeros, 1%. In other words, nothing. What would it be reported? 33% risk reduction. And you could do 10 million, you could do a trillion, you could do 100 billion, and they would still report it as 33% risk reduction. My friends, this is biologically meaningless. It's not inaccurate. It has nothing to do with statistical significance. It's simply good old fashioned, plain, meaningless. And that is how medical science and your doctor reports to you the benefit of drugs. Now, let's apply that. Uh, there's one more thing about that, which makes it even more interesting. There's also in every drug trial and every vaccine trial, there's a reporting of the side effects. In other words, two of the people who didn't take the drug got side effects and 10 of the people in, who did take the drug got whatever side effect they're looking for. Believe it or not, those are reported in absolute numbers. In other words, if it was a million, 0.00008% got a side effect, that's obviously insignificant compared to the 33% reduction. And there you go, total, complete, absolute fraud. And one of the things I'm giving everybody a homework assignment is to ask your family doctor, A, do you know what risk reduction means? B, if you know what it means, some will and some won't, do you believe in reporting medical numbers, medical trials, as risk reduction, because if they do, they are giving you biologically, scientifically, medical, meaningless uh, advice based on numbers which mean nothing. Because nobody wants to take a drug that if you give a million people, it improves the situation by 0.0001% and it improves the uh, side effects by a quadrupled or more number. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because if you do those exact same numbers for the recently published Moderna trial, what do you find? You find that there was 90 people in the control group, and we don't even know what they were given as a control. Undoubtedly, it was not just a saline injection, but it's possible because we don't need to know that we haven't seen the published data. So 90 out of the 15,000 uh, in the control group got symptoms. And here's where David Martin corrected me. I thought they were doing PCR tests, even though, as I said, I wasn't sure because they hadn't reported on the data. It turns out not only were they not doing a bogus and meaningless test of a virus, not only do they admit that they were not testing for transmission of this imaginary virus. So essentially there was no test of a virus. There was no test of transmission. So what were they testing for? What did these 90 out of 15,000, which is 0.6%, 0.6% got symptoms, which could have been practically anything. And they could have, uh, put some sort of anti-inflammatory or symptom reducing medicine into the vaccine. We don't know. They could have also gained this in many other ways to create symptoms at 14 days and not in seven days. There's a lot of ways you could create increased symptoms. Again, we think of vaccines as 
preventing getting sick from a virus. They didn't test anything about a virus. We also think of vaccines as preventing transmission and the trial had nothing to do with transmission, which is exactly why Fauci said, even though we're gonna come out with a vaccine, you'll still have to do social distancing and masking because the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission. So this is not a test of a vaccine. But anyways, let's get back. So nine out of the 15,000, in other words, 0.6% in the vaccine, in the control group, sorry, got symptoms, nothing to do with virus, nothing to do with transmission, just symptoms. And five out of the 15,000, 0.03% got symptoms in the vaccine arm of the trial. So what's the difference? Anybody who can do sixth grade math knows that the difference is 0.57%. That is the biologically, scientifically, medical, meaningful result, even though it has a lot of questions as far as, does that mean anything? Were they putting other things in there to create less symptoms? Did they somehow use timing so that at 14 days they would have less symptoms? All those things are still questions, but all you could say is there was a 0.57% reduction in symptoms. So you may be wondering how did they come up with the number 94.5% reduction, way above the 90% threshold that would suggest that they should fast track this vaccine? It's very simple if you know risk reduction, 90 plus 95, uh, nine, sorry, 90 plus five, 90 with symptoms in the control, five with symptoms in the vaccine, the total is 95, 90 over 95 is 94.5%. That is the risk reduction and it is biologically, scientifically, medically meaningless not inaccurate, not needs to be improved, simply meaningless. It has nothing to do with your health, nor does it for any drug trial. We should abolish the use of relative risk because it's only used to manipulate people in doing what they want you to do. So I hope that clears it up and I would encourage everybody to watch David Martin's brilliant video where he goes into this in great detail. Thank you.